Now, we're going to go and continue on in uh, Matthew today, and it's an amazing thing. What happens to the king happens to the, uh, the disciples because we started off this thing, what happens to the herald happens to the king, and it's a continuation. There's always an association here, but I have been um, watching on the, uh, the, the chat site, and sometimes there's some very, very intense uh, posts put on, uh, and... Uh, quite frankly, I would like uh, some other posts put on because you and I are all born again Christians. Who isn't here? The uh, problem solved. You and I have a destiny in heaven that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived of what God has for us. So whatever is happening on this earth, where we're going is beyond our comprehension. All right, no more pain, no more shame, no more dying. And so at the end of that, so you've got, you know, I get a little bit concerned about this, this, this obsession with, with um, downness. And I was thinking about um, Schwab and I was thinking about Gates and I was thinking about Fauci and Soros and all the rest of them. And in my carnal flesh, I do have some, um, I, I sort of was wondering, oh, it'd be good if just someone would do something about them, all right? <laughs> In a very Christian way. But, but one of the things that, that I, I was thinking about, um, and, and I go deep into these things, and I thought, I've said to you a few times, uh, if there wasn't a Hitler, there wouldn't have been a Holocaust, and if there wasn't a Holocaust, there'd never be the reestablishment of Israel. And Israel is God's end time Clock, And so it started uh, 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 turning around on May the 14th, 1948. And I really sort of thought hard about that. If you didn't have a Hitler, you didn't have the Holocaust, you didn't have Israel. So I thought, what really was going on in the 30s with this man? And if any of you, want, any of you historians want to come up and grab this later, but I actually Googled and explored whether or not there was a number of assassination attempts on Hitler, all right? And I have no fewer than 42 verified attempts on his life from 1932 in the Hotel Kaiserhof, unknown. Hitler and several members of his staff fell ill after dining at the rever uh, revered Kaiserhof Hotel in Berlin. Poisoning was suspected, but no arrests were made. Hitler himself seemed to be least affected by the alleged poisoning, possibly due to his vegetarian diet. And we go through all of this, 42 here. If any of you are um, historians, you're welcome to take that. But I was thinking, we get flesh, and it overtakes us sometimes, we get very emotional, because we hate seeing unrighteousness flourishing in this world. Uh, when we were growing up, uh, when Sue and I were growing up, uh, I was mid-50s um, as a gentleman. I won't say what hers was, um, but uh, we had the best of the century. We really did. Most of us here had the best of the century. And now when we have our, our little granddaughter around and we have our 17-year-old grandson, um, I grieve for the fact that they won't have the same that we had. Uh, it would be wonderful if they could, but I can't see it. Because, and I was looking at the previously named people that are causing chaos all around the world. And by the way, it's far deeper than that. Um, one of the posts that was put on uh, the chat this week was uh, a, an address given by a guy called Jeremy Lee. And that was in 1991. And it was in a little church over east and uh, he had uh, come across a term back in the late 80s called the New World Order. And so he decided, he didn't know what it was about, so he decided to uh, investigate. And by the time he had spent two or three years investigating, he gave these talks around the country in 1991. And when you listen to that, the whole world was drenched in this evil right back then. It wasn't obvious. He used to go to members of parliament and say, do you know anything about this new world order? And they'd say, oh, well, we've heard about it. 
and Jeremy would say, well, what does it mean? And they said, well, you don't know. They're our elected, elected representatives. They should know. I think, to some extent, they just turned the other way. They didn't want to know. And so, at the end of the day, this insidiousness is so entrenched in the world at the moment um, that I am convinced that everything that we're going through now are the birth pangs. This world is heading for the tri uh, tribulation like a high-speed train, only we don't get there. We get taken out before there. And then we go up, and then we, as Stu said, we uh, prepare ourselves for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. I'm waiting for it. And there are things that just absolutely fascinated me. So when I looked at um, all of that stuff about Hitler and I look at these guys uh, trying to create chaos around the world, God's in total control of them. He can take them out any time he wants, but they're there for a purpose. And he wants his son to come back to this earth and install the first ever government of righteousness on this earth. There has never been one. And so it has to happen this way. And as we go through this book and as we go through the later chapters of Matthew, you'll find out what Jesus says about these times, particularly in 24, 25 and various other passages. Uh, but I'm going to read out this now. I'm going to read out the passages. If you're in your Bible, uh, got your Bible, I hope you've got your Bible because um, we're going to do this from 34 through to 38 at the end of 9 because we didn't do that last year because this is part of chapter 10 and we're going to ch verse 15 in chapter 10. And in verse 34, But the Pharisees said, he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. And I never expounded on that last week because that's actually the third messianic miracle which confirms that Jesus is the Messiah. And we, we will look at that in Matthew 12. But here, the Pharisees said, he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. And verse 35, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing how many? Every. every sickness and every disease among the people. That was to validate his claim to be the Israeli Messiah. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And verse 1 of chapter 10, And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to what? Do exactly what Jesus has done. To cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, uh, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs. For a worker is worthy of his food. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. And if the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy... Let your peace return to you. 
and whoever will not receive you or hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Amen. So we're going back to verse 34. Don't worry about Leslie, she's just got asthma and, and she's got nothing else, so don't worry about it. She sometimes says, and, 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 and Ben says to me, Mum worries about this and, uh, uh, and people, you know, wonder. But it's just asthma love, isn't it? Yes, thank you. Verse 34. But the Pharisees said, he casts out demons by the ruler of de demons. This is Beelzebul. Now, the important thing about this um, inc uh, incident here and the one in, in uh, chapter 12 is different because this is local Pharisees saying that he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. In chapter 12, we get the official national authentic, uh, authentic uh, rejection of Jesus by the Sanhedrin. And that's it. It's done and dusted. Jesus is finished as having any chance in, um, uh, in Israel of being the Messiah. Um, Arnold Fuchtenbaum has a very interesting comment on this particular passage, especially in 12. He said that the Jewish people, and this is a Jew speaking, he says, the Jewish people have always had a leadership problem. And by that I mean they believe everything their leaders generally tell them. Do you understand? And when Sue and I have been... Uh, talking to our Jewish friends, and we've had them since 1997, when we tell them what is actually in the, in the scriptures, in fact, I used to, for five years, actually teach a large group of uh, Jewish residents in the Morrisif at home in the Devorah uh, sitting room. Um, I even took this along. And I used to make old Yaakov Gudeman go into the synagogue and get the Torah and bring it back in and slam it down Tanakh, sorry, it's the whole Bible, not the Torah, the first five. And I used to say to, to Yaakov, I said, you make sure you follow me along because I'm always going to teach you from, from the Old Testament. And we would do things like um, Isaiah and uh, Psalm 22 and Zechariah and uh, Ezekiel. They were very interested in Ezekiel 38 and 39. My wife was actually sitting next to a Jewish lady on Friday night. Uh, her husband is in the, the unit with dementia. Sue was with Reby. And the lady made the comment, is, isn't this the world going strange at the moment? Well, that's the worst thing to say to her. <laughs> because then she got a Bible study all about Ezekiel 38 and 39. She said, that's amazing. And you know what? When we tell the Jewish people these things and have done for nearly 25 years, they say one thing. It's always the same thing. Why don't our rabbis tell us this? Because they don't. What they do is they exhort their congregations at all time to be good citizens. And that's half the problem with modern Christianity. I've had people who have now come to this church from other churches said, we were never taught anything in the Bible, but we were taught social graces and how to get on in life. But nothing about what the Bible tells us, how to live a life and what is our, going to be our future. And it's the same thing. I mean, you, you blame these um, um, rabbis for not telling the Jewish people what is in the, the scriptures. And I get the um, Maccabean uh, magazine every uh, week electronically. And I always go to the last page because there's a little Pasha event given by the, the chief rabbi at the large synagogue in Plantation Street. And you just shake your head because it's an extrapolation of the actual words of God to mean what they don't mean. But are applicable to your good behaviour in these days. And this is the same problem that we have in this passage. And I said to you last week, the, the, 
the degree of animosity now between the Pharisees and scribes and Jesus is it, it's gone into the red zone. And they're saying this, he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. And my comment here is in my notes. John the baptizer, when he was working down at Bethabara in uh, the Jordan and baptizing people, he had called the scribes and Pharisees who came to see him and watch and see what was going on. He called them a brood of vipers, which is children of the devil. Children of the devil. Meaning... And now in verse 34, the leadership is returning the insult upon Jesus. It's always deflection. If you don't like what someone's saying about you, you always want to change direction and take their mind off what the actual subject is. So they're now telling everyone that will listen to them that Jesus has a power, but it's given to him by Beelzebub. So the die of extreme antagonism has been cast between the Pharisees and Jesus because of his comprehensive repudiation of the oral law and the vast volume of do's and don'ts that the Mishnah has laid on the Israelite people referred to by Jesus as the tradition of elders. And when I read all of that out last week about what happens with milky and meaty um, meals and dishes and kitchens and all the rest of it, um, I said to you I was going to give you an example, but we ran out of time, and I'm going to give you an example now. Flashback 1997, Sue's a new employee at Morris Effort, and she hasn't got a clue what meaty and milky is. Uh, she doesn't know what the difference is. She just sees cutlery and plates. So anyway, after the Seder meal, everything comes out, gets uh, uh, cleaned in the kitchen, washed in the kitchen, brought round to the various units, and here my wife is busily putting the, all the plates and cutlery away, and the house mother, a um, Moroccan Jew lady, lovely girl, a lovely lady, um, Mercedes Dembo, and she comes in and she sees what Sue's doing, and she goes, ah! She did, scream! She was horrified. My wife was putting milky plates in a meaty cupboard. <laughs> and Sue's going, what on earth have I done? What have I done? What have I just putting cups and saucers away and plates. And so Mercedes had to go round to the office and she came back with one of those canister things that, um, that uh, people with hobbies use when they're trying to melt solder. You know the little gas flame things, the little portable ones? And she got that and lit it. And every plate that she had put in the wrong cupboard had to go under the fire. Every single plate had to be cleaned by fire. <sighs> She's never forgotten. And neither has Mercedes either. A couple of years later, we, we were taking a little um, uh, Malaysian nun, Sister Martha, around Perth. And this Jewish couple, um, well, actually, he was Jewish. She was a, a Gentile convert. And they invited all of us around for a cup of tea in the afternoon. And like a good person, a good guest, after I'd finished my cup of tea and my biscuit, I picked up my cup and saucer and just went into the kit through the kitchen and just leant over and put the cup and saucer on the bench, right just inside the door. She ran out through, through the, past me, got into the kitchen, and she said, it's, it's the wrong side. And I'm thinking, what is really important in this life? Do you know what? It's amazing that irrelevant rules and regulations take a hold of a human mind more strongly than the word of God does. Rules and regulations. Why? Because they think they're being religious when they do these things. And God upstairs is just going, oh, yeah. he's very Jewish. All right. <laughs> so Jesus is saying this about the tradition of the elders. And I'm going to leap forward to Matthew 15, 1 to 9, just to prove how, um, how intense this, this uh, uh, conflict between them are. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, 
Why do your disciples transgress the what? The tradition of the elders, the Mishnah. Why do your disciples do that? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now, if you go back to uh, um, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, there's lots of exhortations in there about washings and washing your hands. But nothing fanatical, just good hygiene. Do you know who the people group was that, that put an abeyance to the Black Plague in Europe? in the 15th and 16th century? The Jews. Because everyone wondered why they weren't dying and everyone else was dying. It was their hygiene within the ghettos. And that changed a lot in Europe in those times. Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? And the problem that they had taken, just simple washings for various things... They insisted that you scrub yourself mad up to the elbow elbow, before you would even eat a piece of leavened bread, right up to here. And so that's, what, that's the extreme that they take it to. And so being a Jew, Jesus answers a Jew and a question with a question. I mean, I, I, I love this anecdote that um, Fruchtenbaum goes, if you go up to a Jewish person and say, what's two plus two? He'll say, why do you ask? <laughs> do you get it? Yeah. They always answer a question with a question because they want to know why you're asking. And that has an incredible influence on the answer that you give. So Jesus says this, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded saying, honour your father and your mother and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. So where is honour your father and mother in the Bible? Fifth commandment. First four, you and God. Last six, you and everyone else in society. And in Leviticus 20 verse 9 and in several other places in the, old, uh, in the, in the Torah... Uh, is that saying, he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, this is Jesus hammering the Pharisees, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever gift you might have received from me is instead a gift to God. Then, Jesus still speaking, he need not honour his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God the fifth commandment in the first ten, of no effect by your tradition. And this, I've got it in heavy black type in, in, the, in verse 7. Hypocrites, said Jesus, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying this, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as divine truth, doctrines, the commandments of men. How many of you here are ex-Catholics? You know what? You make some of the best born-again Christians I've ever met in my life. We had a lady come up from Rockingham one day at our Bible study and she, was, she had come out of the Catholic faith, or well, Catholic church, whether it's a faith or not, I'm not sure. But anyway, she stood up in our little group and she looked at all of the people in the group and she said, I want the Ten Commandments and in the right order. And everyone went, don't ask me, don't ask me. But you know what? She said, when we were kids, the nuns belted it into us. Not a good way to teach, but you remembered it for the rest of your life. But there are so many things in Catholicism that are just the commandments of men. And by the way, it's turning uh, this way in, in, uh, in evangelical Christianity. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, when he was uh, invited to speak at a large church uh, in California, he was waiting in the foyer. And I, did I tell you this last week? Yeah. And there was all this list of all these don'ts. You're not allowed to do this. 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 And the elder comes up and says, aren't you glad you're out from under the law? We've done the same thing. 
We have done the same thing. Why? Because hardly any pastor these days will go back to this thing and tell you what's in it and what God expects of you. And so this, when he says about the Pharisees, dishonouring their parents, he says this, In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And my notes here are this. One of the most devious perversions of social responsibility the Pharisees had devised was the facility of korban, C-O-R-B-A-N. Wealthy people in Israel at this time, like the Pharisees, had as a commandment from the oral law, from the oral law, they could declare that all of their possessions and assets were korban, that is, dedicated to the temple therefore to God himself. So this facility called Korban, they have total control over it. All of your assets, all of your wealth is, belongs to you, uh, but you can declare it uh, dedicated to the temple. You know, I just laugh because today the rich have tax-free tax foundations. You know, the richest of the rich don't pay a cent in tax. They laugh at us that do. Do you know what I mean? There's nothing new under the sun. And it's the same motive here. The Pharisees still owned the possessions. They, they had um, uh, propriety over them and could avail themselves of any portion of them at any time for their own use. But even if their elderly parents who were struggling financially came to their son and asked for help, the Pharisee could, with the wave of his hand, declare korban, dedicated to the temple. I can't, by law, give you anything. I wish I could, but I can't, because it's korban. And Christianity today is replete with the same nonsense. Take, for instance, the group of, of intellectuals um, that sit in, in a... I'm going to tell you, because I nearly throw stuff at the TV. The, global, the, the Gospel Coalition. How many of you have ever sat in front of the Gospel Coalition? I bet some of you have. And these people sit on a stage talking around in circles, trying to reconcile something here. The Gospel of Jesus which they say is repent for the kingdom of his at hand. Not a problem. He went through that all of, for the first part of his, uh, for his uh, mission because he was trying to get Israel to accept him as their king. So he was telling them the kingdom is at hand. Not a problem with that. And then they try and reconcile that with Paul's gospel, which is Jesus died for your sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day. That's, and they say, how can we marry up Jesus' gospel and Paul's gospel. Do you know why? Because these people are reformed people and they're reformed religionists who reject dispensationalism. And I tell you what, I took up dispensationalism early in my faith because it helped me understand the entire Bible put together. And dispensationalism demands a literal interpretation of Scripture, a division between Jew and Gentile, and Israel and the church. If you don't believe that, then you're reformed. And I'm, I've done this before with, uh, with some of you, but a lot of you are new. I'm going to give you a two-minute lesson on dispensationalism. Are you ready? You got your Bible? Right. Go to Genesis 1. Hold it there, and then go all the way up to Genesis chapter 11. That there, all right? Who is that? Who are the people in those first 11 chapters? Gentiles, are they not? Then you go from Genesis 12, Genesis 12, all the way down to Acts chapter 2. All the way down to Acts chapter 2. 
Who's in that portion? And Jews and Gentiles. All right? That's your second division. Then you go from Acts 2. What happens in Acts 2? And you go to Revelation chapter 4. Who's in that lot? And, and the church. Jews, Gentiles, and the church. And when we're out of here, and when we're in Revelation 4 and 5 up there, we go back to Jews and Gentiles again. Do you understand? That's the simplest explanation I can give you of dispensationalism. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand what even happens in Revelation. You don't understand why Ezekiel 38, 39 happens. You don't understand why Israel is God's time clock. Because there is no date specified in the, in the Bible for when you and I as the church go, Psst. it's imminent and it can happen at any time. That's why I said a few weeks ago, I've been talking to my wife about this. It's so, you can taste it. You can feel it. It's coming. And I've said to Sue, the biggest uh, influence on me at the moment is to, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Test yourself to see that you be walking in the faith. Because what are you going to be doing when he takes you up? Walking in the faith. One would hope so, Jackie. Very much. That's the most compelling verse for me at the moment. I've got to test... By the way, un, the unsaved can't test themselves because they don't even know what faith is. Do you understand? That's a command. That's an imperative from Paul for you and I to constantly test ourselves to see if we be walking in the faith. And it's interesting that it really came to that church the Corinthian church. In verse 35, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues. They allowed him in, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. When did the uh, preaching of the gospel of the kingdom stop? It stopped in, in chapter 12 when the national leadership of Israel repudiated Jesus. And his teaching from there on in, I can't wait to get to 12, 12 and 13, I just love. That's the beginning of the training of the disciples for the church age. And they become the pillars of the church. But until that rejection, until that rejection, Jesus and his disciples, John the Baptist started it, didn't he? He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he hadn't even seen Jesus yet, but the Holy Spirit had impelled him to do that. And the moment he first saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. The Holy Spirit impelled him to recognize Jesus. That's when the gospel of the kingdom came into being. And repent for the kingdom is at hand, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Every, nothing left out. Why? To validate his claims. And the more he validated his claims, the more hostile the rejection from the leadership became. And verse 36, But when he, Jesus, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. And I was listening to Dave Hocking um, early in the week, and he said this, uh, I, I'm not going to give it to you, it's a Greek word that you'll never remember, but it, it's the strongest emotion that a human being can have. It's the strongest emotion. There is nothing intellectual about it. It's a feeling. There's another use of this word in the scriptures, calling your bells. And you're not bells for the, what we would think of, but it's that inner you that knows something that never came from here. It's called, and in this he said, it's compassion for them. 
because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the labourers are few. Verse 38, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers in into his harvest. And um, in that same teaching with Dave Hocking, I was listening to it, and he said, um, over 40 years of teaching, when I've been, because his older brother was out as a missionary in Africa. And by the way, Sue's been to Russia four times, Jamaica once, America, um, badly needs evangel- uh, um, a missionary uh, over there at the moment. But let me tell you this. He said he would ask people who were in these mission groups in the churches, are you praying for missionaries to go out to these various countries? Because apparently back in then, this was back in the early 90s, someone had come up with this statistic that there were 16,000 people groups on the earth that still hadn't have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I, I never get upset about that because what's Romans 1 all about? Even that thing out there is a witness to the reality of God. The creation itself is a witness to the, the, the existence of God. And when he talked to these groups, so uh, are many of you going uh, overseas as a missionary? And he laughed and he said, most of them said, no, we're praying for other people to go. But, you know, and that's true. How many people here would want to go to the Middle East at the moment as a missionary? <laughs> Listen, we, we, went to, we went to very dodgy places. Sue got chased around um, Russia by the KGB uh, because that was in 2001 and she was working with a Jewish agency. And so that was spooky. Um, uh, I went there twice and um, you know what? Uh, I learned some amazing lessons there. And the, our first, first trip to um, Russia in 98, we took the kids, best time of their lives. But the, there was, because it was just after the wall had come down and we were strangers and we were in a camp way out of, outside of St. Petersburg and we were trying to build bridges with the kids and the staff, but we, the, the, the supervisors and the managers were saying, you know, don't go too close to them. And so we would have morning devotions in, in one of the rooms and there was a team of us and three um, Russian girls as uh, interpreters. Two of them were um, uh, brilliant Christians. They'd only had a Bible for six years. They knew exactly where every verse was that you mentioned in the Bible. They had just ingested it because they hadn't had them. They weren't allowed them for 70 years. And so one of the other girls was agnostic and apparently we were told later that um, I had a a witch come out from um, St. Petersburg uh, who who demanded to talk to me. So we went into this pergola out in the uh, the central square and Lisa was my um, interpreter. And this lady said that there is another lady in St. Petersburg who has just finished the third testament which Jesus told her to write and I'm saying sorry (laughs) and so we had this long involved conversation about what the uh, about what the bible really was about and it took over two hours and all the time Lisa was interpreting right and we found out a few weeks later when we got back to Perth she got saved in a church do you see you'd I you'd I didn't even know it was happening. But you see, you go over there with preconceived plans of what a missionary should do, and all she did was uh, interpret my conversation with this (laughs) ding-a-ling. And it got her saved. It got her saved. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest. I tell you what, it enriches you. Uh, Sue went three times to Western Russia, one time to Far Eastern Siberia. In Siberia, the mosquitoes are about two inches long and they've got air traffic control because they all line up (laughs) to attack you one at a time. I woke up one night in bed and I was 
going like this with my foot, and I had thick socks. I knew to have thick socks on. These things burrow through your socks to get to them. Um, but we had a brilliant time. We had an absolutely brilliant time. But No, you do, because in the spirit you do. You may hate it in the flesh, but you, you think when you get back here, um, when Sue was there for four months with the Jewish agency, she had miracle after miracle after miracle happening every day. And then you come back to Perth and you don't need miracles because everything's here. And Sue went to the Woolworth supermarket the next day and there was these two ladies pushing their, the, big bar, the big trolleys, absolutely laden with food, complaining about the difficulty of living in Perth. <laughs> and so um, in this camp that we went to in 1998, um, we weren't getting through to the Russian people. And this woman here got something from the Holy Spirit and she said to our leader, Sharon, she said, I think today we need to walk around the perimeter of this camp seven times. And it was drizzling. So strong man Stuart said, no, I'm not up for that. We'll get wet. We might get a cold. We might do this sort of thing. And Sharon said, no, we're going to do it. Don't you hate leadership sometimes? <laughs> and we did. And all of a sudden, all of the Russians came out thinking, what on earth are these Westerners doing? Walking round and around the camp for seven, um, seven times. And um, Anna and uh, Nina went to them and they told them about the walls of Jericho coming down. And so that did it. They were our best friends. And they said, we're, they're praying for you and your families and your children and your grandchildren. All the walls came down. Men, do listen to your wives, please. That was a breakthrough. That was an absolute breakthrough. And you learn lessons like that and places like that that you can't learn here. Pray to send labourers into his harvest. Harvest, is there one or two? Who said one? Put your hand up. All right. 1 Corinthians 15 declares Jesus the first fruits from the dead and because we are his body, we also share in that privilege. Then the general harvest, Old Testament, tribulation saints, and the gleanings, in my opinion, can only be the millennial saints. And this is the harvest of righteousness. Galatians 6, 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. James 3.18, and I've asked for the ESV this time. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Blessed are the what? The peacemakers. Peacemakers are the people who win people to Christ because previously they were at enmity with God. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you now have peace with God. Do you understand? They're the peacemakers. And Psalm 126, verse 6. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And because Gene's here, I'm not going to break into song. Um, <laughs> it was one of the first hymns I ever learnt. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. You've got to go to a Presbyterian church to really um, get that. That's the harvest of righteousness. But I loved the first line in that psalm. He who continually goes forth weeping. Why would you be weeping? Why would you be weeping? I'm going to show you why you go forth into this world weeping. Turn to Revelation 14, verses 14 to 20. This is why you weep. And if you have Jesus' compassion that he had for those multitudes, you weep as well. Then I looked and behold a white cloud, the Shekinah glory, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. Who's that? 
Jesus, having on his head a golden crown. Fascinating this. That's the word Stephanus, which is a victor's crown. When he comes back in Revelation 19 that Stu mentioned on a, on a horse and with us, he has many diadems, ruling crowns on his, on his head. And in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice, To him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come. When is this? This is Revelation chapter 14. The beast is already here. The false prophet is here. They're annihilating uh, every Jew they can find. The whole place is, is a complete and utter disaster. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap. You see, there is times delegated by God that we must be part of. Even if our own human minds can't understand why he's doing things this way, the end result is always divinely perfect. And he said to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. So he gave the authority with his gesture to do this. Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which is also in heaven who had power over fire and he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, this is the angel, not Jesus, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the what? The wrath. the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. This is Armageddon, and you don't want to be there. Armageddon out of there a long time before that. But if we take this literally as a dispensationalist does, that's horrifying because it's the harvest of the unsaved. That's why every day you should go out weeping with the compassion that Jesus had when he saw the multitudes who were like sheep without a shepherd. You are, I'm looking at you now, you are the most privileged people on this earth at this time because you are already the blood-bought children of your God. But there's so many out there that aren't. So many out there that aren't. That's the second harvest. And so we just finish off quickly in Matthew 10, 1 to 15. The 12 apostles sent out two by two. Why two by two? Because in Torah, you must have two or at least three witnesses to verify something. So Jesus is sending them out in a Levitical uh, um, uh, process. In verse 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 1, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power. And now all of you are going to tell me what the Greek word for power is. Dunamos? Wrong! In this, in this passage is exousia. And we've done this word before. It's delegated power. It's power from Jesus given to them. Delegated power. For a period, and he gave them this power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal how much? All, All kinds. He had, they had to copy Jesus because they were preaching the same gospel, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and they had to validate Jesus' claim and they had to do exactly what Jesus was doing and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles, and which in Greek is called apostolae, which is the sent ones, but here's an interesting thing. 
Uh, when Jerome uh, translated the Greek into Latin, the word here, apostle, is miso, where we get our English word missionary, who is a sent one. Our church sent us to Russia and Sue to Russia and to Jamaica. And if you think it's fun going to Jamaica, they lived on a millionaire's house on the beach at Montego Bay. But do you know what they were doing there while they were in Montego Bay? They were going down to the local jail, going down the stairs to the dungeon beneath where all these little kids were in jail who didn't have a home, were on the streets fighting, stealing, petty crimes, and they were just put all in this dungeon. And unless some good person came along and gave them food, they starved. This is in Jamaica in Montego Bay. And do you know what? When they get enough kids into those um, um, jails, they pack them all up, put them on a plane, fly them to Brazil, and people in Brazil, sorry Augusto, but this is true, people in Brazil get the kids out of the slums in Brazil and they put them on large planes and they send them to the Middle East to the sheikhs. Now, can you imagine what would happen to those kids over there? So if you think going to Montego Bay in Jamaica is a brilliant job for a missionary, you try going down to that dungeon. And first, the first day they were there, they were weeping and crying with all these little kids and all the rest of it, and the pastor came down, and he reamed the woman out. He said, we don't know how long these kids are going to be in this jail before they're on the plane. So you don't stand here saying how lovely they are and feed them and all the rest of them. You get them to Christ as soon as you can because that's the only hope for their future. In Montego Bay, where people pay thousands to go as a tourist. Seriously. Apostoli Miso, missionaries, sent ones. First, Simon. There's four lists of um, uh, the disciples in the Gospels. And who was always first? Simon Peter. Isn't it funny that it's not the disciple that Jesus loved? It's up and Adam, Adam Ant, Peter. And you know what? He had the character... I, 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 I get so angry when I hear modern commentators make fun of this man. I, it's disgusting. And I'll tell you why. Because none of them on YouTube or in other teachings I've got were ever asked to be the pillar of the church, the first among the apostles, and an author of two of the New Testament epistles. And these people make jokes about him. And do you know what? I said to Sue a long time ago, can you imagine how red their glorified faces will get when they have to stand in front of him and say, hi, Peter, and Peter says, no, I heard what you said. <laughs> Don't ever make fun of Peter, ever. And Andrew, his brother, Peter's always first, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bar uh, Bartholomew. See, two by two, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector and James the son of Alphaeus and Lebaeus whose surname was Chaddeus. Now listen, Simon, uh, Peter and Andrew are brothers, James and John are brothers and according to Mark 2.14 where Matthew was called Levi the son of Alphaeus, a lot of commentators assume that Matthew and James the son of Alphaeus were brothers. So you've got three sets of brothers. And then Simon the Canaanite, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Judas is always last in the list. But here's an interesting thing. There's a promise made by Jesus to these 12 disciples. Not Judas, but the one that replaces him. He said, you will rule and reign over the 12 tribes of Israel. And I thought, now that's fascinating. You would think that one Jew from each of those tribes would rule over that tribe in the millennium. 
but you got three sets of brothers. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Um, I didn't put this in, guys, but can you um, be nice to me? Uh, John 6, verse 70. John 6, verse 70. It's amazing. You can align this with what I said about Hitler and also about um, Schwab and all his gang. Have a look at this. Jesus answered to them, did I not choose you the 12 and one of you is a devil? Why did he choose Judas? Because to fulfill prophecy, he had to be betrayed and crucified. Do you understand? It had to happen. And God was in control of every step of the way. And by the way, brothers and sisters, he still is. He still is. And he sent out this 12. These three things are interesting. One, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not to the Gentiles and not to the Samaritans, because he's still trying to get them to accept him as the king. Preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead and cast out demons. And verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying all of these things, go not into the way of the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you preach, there's a, there's a different word here than what Paul uses in his epistles. This word is caruso, which is like a herald coming before a king. And it's speaking out divine truth, but as a herald, as a, as a formal thing. When Paul is using the word preach in the New Testament, it's called euangelizing. And the word there is gospeling. So it's always preaching the gospel that Jesus has died for your sins, was buried, rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the the gospel that now comes after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why. Because the offer of the kingdom has not been um, withdrawn, it's been postponed. And it'll be given to Israel again in the tribulation. That's what the tribulation is for. If you ever wondered why, in that passage in Daniel chapter 12, that the, the, the overflowing scourge is to break the back of the stiff-necked people, and we love them to bits. Sue and I love them to bits. But they drive you mad. They just can't see. And when Sue came back from Friday night saying that she'd been teaching this Jewish lady all about Ezekiel 38 and 39, I said to Sue, she should be teaching you. That's what Israel was supposed to be, a witness to the nations. Here we are, the church is doing that job. But when we're out of here, it goes back to them. And there's 144,000 very good ones that come out in, in Revelation chapter 7. And we'll get there soon. And as you preach, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received. This is his uh, authority. Freely give. And here, now this is something that's fascinating. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor a bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. And I've got here, can you imagine the look on the disciples? He wants us to go all over Israel and we can't take a thing when we leave here. And I tell you what, Sue and I have got testimony after testimony after testimony when we're in that situation and God provides if you've got tons, why would he bother? When you've got nothing but you're obeying him, it floods in. It floods in. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire in it who is worthy. Worthy isn't saved. Worthy is willing to listen. Willing to listen. And stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy... Then let your peace, your shalom, came up, come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you or hear you, your words, when you depart from that house, 
or that city shake off the dust from your feet. And the most compelling and amazing verse is verse 15. And when we, in a couple of chapters, we've got to do, uh, refer to the great white throne judgment. And assuredly, Jesus says, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Can you imagine that? They're going to be treated more harshly than Sodom and Gomorrah at the great white throne judgment. And you and I will be sitting there on thrones judging angels. Jesus gets to judge the uh, resurrected human beings. And if you don't ever often think about it, you look in the mirror the next time and say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Father, we come before you this afternoon. And Father, Jesus is so important in our lives, in his direction, in his um, um, kindness towards his Father. That when we think we have nothing, that we have nothing and we can do nothing, he gives us his delegated power. And when we choose to use it in, uh, to his glory, then we have an opportunity to bring in the sheaves, Father, to bring in those who have accepted Jesus Christ as, his, as their Lord and Saviour. And so, Father, I ask you now to give us that desire, that weeping compassion for the lost in these days because the time is short and you are coming. And, Father, we just ask this now in Jesus' name and all God's people said...